wild week one in fantasy football and some players exceeded expectations which means their stock is rising we're going to talk about a bunch of them right now maria marino for fantasy sports network alongside frank stample and frank let's start with a quarterback patrick mahomes of the chiefs how did you like what you saw from him Yeah, I thought this was very impressive, Maria, for him to go on the road in week one against a pretty good Chargers defense. Yes, they didn't have Joey Bosa, but still boast a very strong secondary there. Tyreek Hill absolutely went off, obviously, in part to Patrick Mahomes, you know, For him to be able to make those kind of throws down the field, these long bombs, and connect with Tyreek Hill, I think we're going to see a lot of that this season. Uh, He also added 20 rushing yards in this game, Maria. I really like that there was no turnovers. Something that we saw with Patrick Mahomes throughout the preseason, even in his lone start last year, was that he can be turnover prone. He's going to be a gunslinger in this offense. But again, very impressive for Patrick Mahomes to go on the road in week one and hang four touchdowns against a pretty good Chargers defense. You know, a defense for a team who some people are expecting to go to the Super Bowl this year in the Los Angeles Chargers. So I think he showed you what his upside could be. Uh, We just need to see that going forward again know that he could provide that safe floor, even in games where he does have multiple turnovers. But I think you take this, and he's trending in the right direction. You like what you saw out of, out of Patrick Mahomes in week one, Maria. I certainly liked what I saw from Mahomes. You mentioned the four touchdowns on 256 yards passing, and that all equated over 28 fantasy points on FanDuel. So his stock is definitely up. Let's turn our attention now to Joe Mixon, the Bengals running back. His stock is up as well. 149 total yards from him also got in the end zone, Frank. Yeah, Joe Mixon, what I love here, Maria, is that he played on 78% of the Bengals' snaps in this game. That was his highest percentage since being drafted by the team. One of my worries with Joe Mixon coming into the year was that this team has always used Gio Bernard. As long as he's been on the Bengals with Marvin Lewis, They find ways to use Gio Bernard. That was not the case yesterday, Maria. And what I especially like is that regardless of what the game script was, because there was points in this game where they were trailing against the Colts, and then there were also points where they were ahead. Regardless, Joe Mixon was the running back on the field. He had 17 rushes, 95 yards, a touchdown, seven targets in the passing game, five receptions for an additional 54 yards versus Gio Bernard. One rush for minus one yard. One target, one reception, 11 yards. That type of usage out of your running back, both on the ground and in the passing game, while Gio Bernard is healthy and really wasn't using this game, I think it's very, very telling that Joe Mixon could be an RB1 this year. So again, similar to Patrick Mahomes, the arrow's pointing up on Joe Mixon. Definitely. You alluded to it, a dual threat in the run game as well as the receiving game. And he got over 23 fantasy points on FanDuel. So things are looking good for Joe Mixon. Let's talk about a tight end next. George Kittle of the 49ers. He had 90 yards, although he didn't get in the end zone. That is a nice day for him, Frank. Yeah, another player here who played a ton of the snaps last year. His snap percentage was a little bit inconsistent with the San Francisco 49ers, but one of the reasons that we like George Kittle coming into the year is that he showed a pretty good rapport with Jimmy Garoppolo over those final five, six games that Jimmy G stepped in of last season, and he's picking up exactly where he left off, Maria, against a very, very potent Minnesota Vikings defense. He was the most targeted receiver in this game. He had nine targets. He led this team in receptions and receiving yards, five receptions receptions for 90 receiving yards not to mention Marquise Goodwin was hurt in this game we don't know the extent of Goodwin's injury yet so if he has to miss any significant time that's just going to be more targets more opportunity for George Kittle as long as he can stay healthy health is the biggest key for George Kittle he was banged up in the preseason if he can stay healthy he's going to be a legitimate tight end one this season a guy that you could stream every single week and a guy who's going to have upside in DFS contests this year Maria. And the fantasy points on FanDuel, over 11. That's tight end one territory, my friends. Let's move over to a Patriots receiver, Philip Dorsett. Frank, we always talk about Tom Brady and who is he going to throw to, but he always manages to make it work. Yeah, and Philip Dorsett, a name that's going to surprise you here, probably a guy that you're going to find on waiver wires, a very, very sneaky, cheap play for DFS in week one, but this team opted not to use Chris Hogan as much as we thought they were going to in week one. Hogan was the fourth most targeted receiver on this team, while Philip Dorsett, seven receptions, 
Seven targets, caught all seven of his targets, 466 yards and a touchdown. He looked like the go-to outside receiver for Tom Brady in this week one matchup. Obviously, Gronk is going to do his thing. He's going to lead that team in targets and receptions. Uh, whether he's double-team, triple-team, there's no stopping Gronk. And they also have James White. They throw to the running backs. But I thought it was very telling that when they chose to throw to a wide receiver in this matchup, because it was a pretty good matchup against the Texans, their secondary is a little bit older, they chose to go with Philip Dorsett. So again, I think Chris Hogan, the arrow's kind of pointing down for him a little bit. The arrow's pointing up for Philip Dorsett. If he's available in your season-long leagues, you're going to want to look to go pick him up off the waiver wire. And as you mentioned, his price could be favorable in FanDuel. And this weekend, he got over 16 fantasy points. Up next, we have an oldie but a goodie, Adrian Peterson of the Redskins. I wasn't sure what his usage was going to be, Frank, but it was pretty darn good. Yeah, and Greg Sussman, my colleague, we had him in a league where we joined own together. And I actually told him to bench Adrian Peterson. What a terrible decision that was <laughs> from me. Uh, look, 28 total touches in this game. Look, Adrian Peterson looked like he entered a time machine. Looked like he was playing five years ago with the Minnesota Vikings. 26 rushes for 96 yards. Yes, that's under four yards per carry, but it's really the usage that he dominated here to to earn 30 touches in this game, add an additional 70 receiving yards on just two receptions. The explosiveness was there. The usage was there with Adrian Peterson. Look, this team doesn't have any long-term ties to him. They can choose to run him into the ground this year. They can just feed, feed, feed Adrian Peterson. It is worth noting that they were leading for a lot of this game, so game flow might Dictate if they use him or Chris Thompson moving forward, but I think you have to be excited about Adrian Peterson if you have him in the season long or if you used him in DFS. Whenever this team is leading in games, he's going to get a big workload, Maria. And perhaps the lack of usage that he got last year might be feeding into the fact that he looks refreshed. He looks like vintage AP. And let's go over the numbers one more time. 166 total yards, a touchdown, and on FanDuel, that added up to over 21 fantasy points. And last but not least, the stock is rising, it seems, for Brandon Marshall of the Seahawks, an old friend. You know, he's been on so many different teams. I didn't even know which team he was on going into this season. But Seattle chose to use him 46 yards. He did get in the end zone, a net of over 12 fantasy points on FanDuel, Frank. Yeah, Maria, you mentioned that he's played for so many different teams. Heck, he's played for my favorite team, the Jets. He's played for your favorite team, the <laughs> Giants. And now he lands in Seattle with the Seahawks as potentially Russell Wilson's go-to target in this offense. Look, Doug Baldwin injured his right knee in this game. He was battling a left knee injury throughout the preseason. So now Doug Baldwin is dealing with two bum knees for the entirety of the season. It's only the first week heading into week two. We don't even know what Doug Baldwin's availability is going to be. So Brandon Marshall, in this game, he was the most targeted receiver for Russell Wilson. He had six targets, only hauled in three receptions, but 46 yards and a touchdown. We saw him targeted inside the red zone as well. Russell Wilson is not a guy who's going to key in on any one player, really, but he needs a guy to lean on in the red zone. We saw that with Jimmy Graham last year, and we thought, there was a chance Brandon Marshall can be that player this year for Russell Wilson. And especially if Doug Baldwin is out, I think there's a pretty good chance that's going to happen, Maria. I agree. You know, Russell Wilson, it seems, has lacked offensive weapons. He's had to be the offense on the whole. So it helps to have a veteran presence there like Brandon Marshall. We'll see if Seattle continues to use him as such. And those are all of our players whose stock is rising following a great week one in fantasy football. As with every week in fantasy football, week one had some players whose production left something to be desired. And those are the players we say their stock is trending down. And we're going to talk about a handful of them now. Maria Marino for Fantasy Sports Network alongside Frank Stamfel. And Frank, let's start with Alex Collins of the Ravens. He's an RB1 on a lot of people's season-long leagues. And I'm sure a lot of people picked him up in DFS as well. Yeah, I was one of those players. You know, this is a guy who is very close to me. I have uh, I drafted him in multiple leagues this year. Very excited about Alex Collins coming into the season. 
but you have to at least be slightly worried about the week one usage. Yes, he scored a touchdown early on in that game, but he actually fumbled in the second quarter, and it seemed like he was benched for multiple series in this game. Now, he did come back in in the second half. He had a few carries, but we also saw Buck Allen score a touchdown in this game, and we also saw Kenneth Dixon score a touchdown late in this game. So it's hard to figure out whether or not that's just because the Ravens were leading by so much in this contest or the fact that this team actually benched Alex Collins because they were worried about his fumbling issues. He's had fumbling issues in the past, dating back to his uh, his days on, on the Seahawks practice squad. Uh, he was benched last year because of fumbling. That was the reason why they were a little hesitant to make him their workhorse running back. So it'll be interesting to see the running back usage for the Ravens Thursday night going up against the Bengals, an AFC North matchup, uh, where those are really hard-hitting really close matchups. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the usage is, but I think the fact that he was outperformed by two other running backs on his team, you have to be slightly worried about that, Maria. Well, the complexion of this game was certainly out of the ordinary because it was such a blowout, and you mentioned the fumble. Do you think you would be willing to take a shot on him? Perhaps his price has gone down in terms of setting your lineup for week two. Yeah, one week's trash could be the next week's treasure, right? So, uh, look, if his if his price goes down on uh, on FanDuel because of it, as a result, uh, I think that game is going to be a lot closer. Again, the Ravens and Bengals. If you think that he's going to be the workhorse again, which personally I do, then you might be able to get him at a bargain price because of that. So I think that's a pretty good call, Maria. Uh, but just based on the way that this game shaked out, you have to at least be a little bit worried about it. Okay, so maybe one more week to see what happens. And if it goes back up, you feel good. But the numbers on Collins for week one, 19 total yards. He did get a touchdown, but just 6.4 fantasy points on FanDuel. Our next player whose stock certainly went down is a quarterback of the Cowboys, Dak Prescott. And I was stunned. I knew he didn't have a good game, Frank, but only 8.7 fantasy points on FanDuel. Yikes. Yeah, he threw the ball 29 times in this game. He completed 19 of them for just 170 yards. Who would have thought you get rid of Jason Witten, a Hall of Fame tight end, you release Des Bryant, your number one wide receiver, and your passing offense gets a lot worse. This is something that we feared about the Cowboys offense coming into the year that, you know, defense will just be able to zone in on the run and Ezekiel Elliott because they don't really have passing options that can beat you down the field. Now, the team went out and signed Alan Hearns and they drafted Michael Gallup, but those players were not used much in this game. So it's kind of head scratching why they went out and got these weapons, but didn't really use them in the first game in a matchup that seemed pretty good against the Carolina Panthers secondary, which is not very good. Yes, the Panthers are stout up front. They have a good front seven, but their secondary was able to be had last year. And I think that could have been the case in week one. So he targeted Cole Beasley a lot in this matchup. We didn't see a lot of rushing production out of Dak Prescott as well. So I think you have to be worried about the lack of the weapons and the fact that the play calling was really, really stale in this game, Maria. They might not have a choice but to go ahead and call up their friend uh, Des Bryant for uh, a reunion. I'm sure Des would love that. He was all over the Twitter last night, and I'm sure having a couple giggles at the Cowboys' expense. But, you know, Dak Prescott doesn't seem like he can make up for the lack of connections with his receivers, with his legs. And they have the Giants come week two. And for all of the weaknesses that we saw in the Giants week one, their secondary actually looked pretty solid. So the the stock for sure trending down on Dak Prescott. But let's move on to our next player. It's Chris Hogan of the Patriots. He's another one whose stock is trending down. Again, with the Pats, we never quite know where Bill Belichick is going to go with his game plan, but he certainly didn't go to Chris Hogan, who only had 11 yards on the day. Yeah, targeted just five times in this offense. He was the fourth highest targeted receiver on this team. He was behind Gronk. He was behind Philip Dorsett. He was even behind James White. Only one reception for 11 yards. The one thing that I will lean on here, something that you mentioned, Maria, is the fact that Bill Belichick's offense is unpredictable week in and week out. We know Gronk is going to get his, but there could have been something that Bill Belichick saw on film that said, okay, we're going to attack this team with James White. Uh, we're going to use Philip Dorsett. Maybe next week it's Chris Hogan. I just think it's worrisome because people were using a pretty high draft pick on Chris Hogan, including myself, a fourth, fifth round pat, uh, draft pick in season long. And then 
a lot of people used him in daily yesterday as well. And he, you know, he wasn't one of the cheaper wide receivers. He was priced like, you know, a low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three. So to see this kind of usage in the first game and the fact that they won 27 20 without using him makes me a little bit worried about Chris Hogan moving forward. I'd be a little bit worried too. And it's not like this game was a blowout, it's not like it was a strange sort of progression of the game itself. But Hogan ends up with only 1.6 fantasy points on FanDuel. Another player who's trending down as well, you could say, after a less than impressive week one performance, it's Derrick Henry of the Titans. He had just 31 total yards, Frank. Yeah, the Titans running back situation and really their offense overall is going to be a tough one to figure out this year, Maria. They've already lost Delaney Walker to a fractured ankle. Marcus Mariota is dealing with an elbow injury. Uh, We don't know the extent of that yet. So this offense is really in shambles. And the running back usage, Deion Lewis absolutely dominated snaps in this game. and He also dominated touches. I mean, he ran the ball 16 times to Derrick Henry's 10. Deion Lewis also had eight targets in this game, whereas Derrick Henry only had one. I think their usage is going to be inconsistent on a week-in and week-out basis. It's going to be predicated by game flow. If the Tennessee Titans are winning games and they're winning big, they're just going to lean on Derrick Henry to kind of grind out the clock uh, while they have the lead. If they're chasing points or if they're in a shootout-type atmosphere, Maria, Deion Lewis is going to be the guy on the field, a guy that they can use in the hurry-up offense, a guy who is versatile, he can run, catch the ball out of the backfield. So based on this week one usage, you feel pretty good about Deion Lewis, but if you're a Derrick Henry owner in season long or you use him in DFS, you're not feeling great about Derrick Henry after week one. And how could you when he netted just 3.6 fantasy points on FanDuel? And let's Talk about the entire Titans offense as a whole. You alluded to it, Frank, but they only had 336 total yards on the day. So just the Titans offense in general is not looking good. Yeah, especially the passing attack. Even when Marcus Mariota was in there, he didn't look very good. And this is against a Dolphins team, which we did not expect to be a very strong unit this year especially on the defensive side of the ball. So Marcus Mariota goes 9 for 16, 103 yards, two interceptions against this defense. And then Blaine Gabbert comes in, completes just half of his throws, and also throws an interception. So if Marcus Mariota has to miss any time, that just makes you feel even worse about this team's offense. Blaine Gabbert's going to step in, which is going to ultimately affect the production of Corey Davis and other receivers in this offense. Yeah, just one touchdown on the day. And so the Titans offense as a whole, trending down. We have one more player to talk about whose stock is going down as well. It pains me to say the Giants tight end Evan Ingram had a rough outing in week one. Just 18 yards, no scores. Frank, how did you feel about what you saw from Evan Ingram? So first of all, I will throw this out there that Look, he was going up against the Jacksonville Jaguars defense, so it's a very tough matchup. We know that right out of the gate. And if you're watching this game, Evan Ingram actually had a few receptions downfield that were mitigated by holding penalties from, you guessed it, Eric Flowers on the offensive line, one of the worst (laughs) offensive linemen in the entire NFL. So this day actually could have looked better for Evan Ingram, but overall... This is what we worried about with his usage coming into the season, Maria. Odell Beckham, 15 targets in the offense. Sterling Shepard, 7 targets. Even Saquon Barkley, a phenomenal receiver coming out of Penn State, 6 targets. Evan Engram was behind all of those guys. So that's something I worried about with Engram coming into the season long. And even for DFS, his usage is going to be inconsistent. If there are matchups where the middle of the field is open and teams are really focused on double teaming, even triple teaming Odell Beckham, Those will be the games that Evan Ingram can go off. But you're not going to know that until once the game starts. So he's going to be an inconsistent play overall this year, I believe, Maria. And he only had about 2.8 fantasy points on FanDuel Sunday. But as you mentioned, it was a tough Jacksonville defense. You had the penalties. You also had a drop by Ingram. It was just hard for him to get into a rhythm. We do know what his talent is, though, and he did – get a lot of receptions last year. So we'll see if he can do anything more moving forward. However, with those other weapons and Sterling Shepard and Odell Beckham and now Saquon Barkley, it might be tough. So unfortunately, Evan Engram, his stock is dropping. But those are all of our players whose stock are dropping after a crazy week one. 
And I'm sure we'll have plenty more to talk about next week.